Hi there. You're listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. Interview episode on the army of Ptolemaic Egypt with Dr. Paul Jostineau. Hello once again, everyone. Today I have with me Dr. Paul Jostineau, a historian and associate professor of leadership studies at the Air Command and Staff College in Montgomery, Alabama. He has written numerous articles and chapters on warfare and violence in the ancient world, and today he is joining us to discuss his book, The Army of Ptolemaic Egypt, 323-204 to BC, an institutional and operational history, which was released in late November of this year. Let me begin by saying welcome and thank you for coming on to the show. Oh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm pretty excited to be here. This is one of my first podcast experiences. As a kid who geeked out over battle scenes in movies like Gladiator and 300, uh, historical accuracy notwithstanding, I can easily see the appeal of moving into the study of ancient military history. But perhaps you can give a more learned reason as to what drew you to the realm of warfare during this period. Okay, so I, I, I wound up here for a number of reasons, but you know, I think even for the academics, there's something about the excitement, the difference of that, that comes through in those movies like Gladiator and 300 that is part of the draw for us as well. You know, visiting ancient sites and thinking about the, you know, what it means for people thousands of years ago to have done these things or to think in, you know, in military terms about a time where the killing happened at very close range and in a, in a different fashion than it generally does today. Uh, so one of my first memories about military history is, was watching the Gulf War on TV back in 1991. And I was just blown away at this display of terribly destructive but monumental endeavor. And that's really true for, for warfare on the whole. It's this great builder and destroyer of societies and organizations and and so that that's that's part of what drew it uh, drew me to to military history i liked history because i'm i'm a curious person and studying history endlessly satisfies and stokes my curiosity and with ancient history uh, you know we we basically are playing around with conjecture and complexity and causality and can keep playing with those things because our source base is is both remote and limited and so there's a lot of there's a there's endless curiosity and i was always great at that uh game balderdash as a as a youth and and so it, that ability to conjecture to try to draw together ideas or arguments was something that was appealing for me Really, I ended up in, in the ancient period because I started studying Greek, originally thinking I might go to seminary or something, but I ended up geeking out over ancient history, you know, hoplites and, and reading some uh, Herodotus and Plutarch in my Greek classes back as an undergrad. And then I ended up in the Hellenistic period, thanks largely to uh, study abroad in Turkey about 20 years ago, and uh, kind of gone from there. Now, as the title implies, your upcoming book is focused on the military structure under the Ptolemaic dynasty, the Greco-Macedonian rulers of Egypt who took over immediately after the death of Alexander the Great, and lasted down to its final ruler Cleopatra nearly 300 years later. Could you give us a brief overview of the scope and content of your book, and tell us why you decided to write about the Ptolemies in particular? Okay, so with the Ptolemies, you know, that's, that's my, not movie, but my video game tie-in. Before I ever went to grad school, I'd played this game called Rome Total War. And if, if you're familiar with it, their depiction of Ptolemaic Egypt uh, was oriented pretty heavily toward New Kingdom Egypt, late Bronze Age weapon systems and costuming. It's a very oriental, Orientalist sort of depiction. They weren't particularly Macedonian or Hellenistic. And that got me thinking about interesting questions, you know, how were the Ptolemies like or unlike the other successors? What were the Egyptian or Pharaonic legacies that help us understand the military history of this period? And, and how have the Ptolemies been received for the past 2,000 years or so, first the Romans or even there by other Greeks in the Hellenistic age, and then on down to the present day where you have, you know, blockbuster movies about Cleopatra and these sort of things. And so looking at 
Egypt was interesting for, for those sorts of reasons. Now, I don't look at Cleopatra in the book. I'm focused really on the first little more than 100 years of the Ptolemaic dynasty and its military, especially the army. There's a couple of sea battles. I talk a little bit about the Navy, but my focus is really on their land army. And I want to think about, you know, how did they go about building the army? And what were the missions they wanted the army to be able to complete? And then how did they employ the army in practice? So the history of, of the Ptolemies, if we think, you know, thinking in terms of reception in the third century, uh, under the first few kings that I'm, I'm writing about their reigns in this book, that there's this narrative of decline. You've got the early generations are covered in splendor and glory. Ptolemy the first was a friend of Alexander. Ptolemy the second, Philadelphus, is the wealthiest of all of the Hellenistic kings and rules during this period where Egypt and Alexandria are the, the light of the Hellenistic world. But then there's these steady corrupting effects and, and, and it, this, this ties to Polybius, this kind of laziness that seeps in from the, the wealth of, of Egypt and this, this corrupting effects, you know, develops over time, uh, reaches uh, its, its peak under Ptolemy IV, and then the, the kingdom kind of slowly falls away until it ekes out its existence under the Roman hegemony, you know, pretty much a client kingdom for 150 years. And what I really wanted to do in the book was challenge two, two things there. One, the idea of a seductive, corrupting allure in Egypt. You know, it's the embodiment of Cleopatra herself is how people write about Egypt all through the Hellenistic period. And so I wanted to challenge that idea of corruption and, and allure as a as a narrative and i also wanted to question this idea of the early golden age were they able to establish a golden age so rapidly and then the the brightness of the hellenistic period was slowly weakened by egypt or is the story really uh, could i possibly put it on its head and instead write a story of steady accumulation of strength and glory that, that actually gets stronger over the course of the third century in some ways. And I don't know that that's really the, the truth of what happens, but I, I want to at least try as much as I can to, to flip that narrative around. Following Alexander's death in 323, his commander and friend Ptolemy quickly seized Egypt and turned into his own dynastic kingdom. You mentioned Rome Total War, and I've spent at least 150 hours on that game, and I know it has problems like pink pajama-wearing Parthians and Roman ninjas. It was all that... accurate. It was all accurate, uh, but the Egyptian soldiers were straight out of the mummies movies that were big at the time. How different was the army of the Ptolemies compared to the Macedonian army used by Philip and Alexander? What sort of sources or evidence can we point to indicating any changes that occurred? Well, that's a great question. One of the things that's most appealing about studying the Ptolemies is that we have papyri from Egypt. And in ancient history terms, we really have quite a lot of it. The papyri are mostly pretty mundane in their subject matter, but it's still possible, in fact, because of that, it's possible to look at all sorts of questions at the ground level that you can normally only address through the eyes of a remote aristocratic historian like a Polybius. So with Egypt, Polybius, as I mentioned before, tends to be pretty biased. Being able to check his narratives, like his famous narrative of the reform before the Battle of Raphia, is an incredible opportunity. And Polybius is pretty well respected, but a lot of the things he says about Egypt don't check out relative to the papyrological evidence. As far as uh, the, the Ptolemaic army and how it compares to the Macedonians, they've got a lot of connections to Alexander's army and to contemporary Hellenistic armies, all of which with the Ptolemaic army tend to look back at Alexander's army and imagine that they are in some sense emulating it, even though they're constantly reincorporating new ideas about military affairs into their memory of what Alexander's army was like. Ptolemy got a real plum in Egypt, uh, but he doesn't get much in the way of troops. Instead, he heads to Egypt with a bunch of friends and followers. You know, he's a, uh, an influential apparently fairly charismatic figure at the court, and he was able to bring a number of, of aristocratic followers with him to Egypt, but he's basically got an officer corps without an army. He doesn't get veteran Macedonians, and early on he's forced to rely heavily on mercenaries, although that's what many of his contemporaries are doing as well. 
And he also uh, gives some fairly significant roles early on to Egyptians. Eventually, the, the aim of the Ptolemies is to be able to field a force that looks like a standard Hellenistic force that looks something like Alexander's armies. But it takes some time to get there, and their path to reach that sort of army is different than, say, Antigonid history, where they tend to have much larger uh, Macedonian populations to, to work from along the way. But even so, the, the Ptolemaic army in the middle of the third century BC is still fielding a large Macedonian-style phalanx, Macedonian-style cavalry as the core of their royal army, and at least claiming that most of the men in those formations are themselves Macedonians. Is the army that different? It, its personnel is different, but the main structure of the army, the main units, they, they bear a lot of similarity. Personally, I tend to fall into the camp of Arthur Eckstein and believe that aggressive militarism is an inherent aspect of all the Hellenistic kingdoms. But Ptolemaic Egypt generally does not inspire the same reputation as a great military power when compared to their rivals in Antigone and Macedon, and most especially the Seleucid Empire. From your research, do you believe that this is a fair assessment? And if not, why do you think such a reputation exists? Okay, so first off, I, I'm, I don't really fall in the Eckstein camp uh, for the Ptolemies or for their neighbors. I, I tend to, you know, aggressive militarism is a risky business. And I think uh, for the most part, these are all great military powers, and the Ptolemies tend to be underappreciated. Now, why that happens, uh, some of it is the general Egyptian phenomenon I've mentioned before, and that is exemplified best through Polybius. Part of the problem is also that you have some kings with poor reputations in the period covered by this book. That's that's Ptolemy the fourth, but you could also look at some of the Ptolemy, you know, Ptolemy the eighth in the second century BC, and several of the Ptolemies uh, leading up to the end of the dynasty. But it's worth asking a question: Is is the army poor because the king is? That's not really how things work historically, and so that that suggests that maybe we should think about these things. All right, so if the the view we get from Polybius is well, these kings were worthless, and therefore their army is crap. We should, we should think about how we can interrogate that. So the other thing I'd, I'd point to as far as why the Ptolemaic army doesn't have the same reputation is, is that they didn't get beaten by the Romans. It, it actually turns out, in my opinion, that getting just absolutely hosed by Roman armies tends to put a sheen on your exploits. Reflectively, it's a way, you know, you want to make the person you creamed look like they were pretty good. You know, it's, it's like, you know, they're doing bowl selections right now for college football. You want to have victories over ranked teams. To some degree for the Romans, there's a desire when you're shaping the history to say nice things about the guys you beat because it tends to make you look a little bit better. I think if we had uh, Polybius-like detailed histories from, say, the 270s to the 240s BC, even down into the 230s and 220s, we might have a pretty different general perception of the quality of the Ptolemaic army. Uh, it actually does manage uh, some, some pretty impressive uh, military feats in that period. We just don't have the same sort of historical narrative to, to ground that kind of perception. The Ptolemaic army was by and large built on the backbone of soldiers of Greco-Macedonian or, or alleged Greco-Macedonian origin in the fighting style of the Macedonian phalanx, and they were famously reluctant to recruit native Egyptians. But is this necessarily the case? Are there any examples of the Ptolemies incorporating soldiers or fighting styles of non-Greek origin into their ranks? Okay, so that's one of the big questions I try to address in the book. And I keep going back to Polybius, but you know, so much of how we understand the Hellenistic world, Ptolemaic Egypt goes back to Polybius narratives. And so he described Ptolemy IV recruiting Egyptians into the army for the first time while he was hastily reforming his army or while his ministers were hastily reforming the army prior to the battle at Raphia with Antiochus the Great. In the book, I argue that, that that's quite wrong. The military role of the Egyptian soldier class, what we call the Makamoi, did evolve and expand in the era of the Fourth Syrian War and around the time of, of Raphia. They had probably not served as a major component of the phalanx before that time. In fact, they, they mainly served in paramilitary roles before that time and in roles in the Navy. 
However, large numbers of other Egyptians, many of them fairly Hellenized, were serving in the main regiments of the Greco-Macedonian Ptolemaic army throughout the third century. So that's an important thing to recognize, that while they were famously reluctant to recruit the native Egyptians, what, what really was significant about the, the Raffia campaign was the recruitment mainly unhellenized Egyptians. Recruitment's probably the wrong word, but the, uh, the commitment of these non-Hellenized Egyptian bodies of paramilitary soldiers, police, these sort of things toward a real battlefield role, largely or partly unaccompanied by expectations of Hellenization. And so that's that's what's really significant there. If you look in the evidence from Ptolemaic Egypt, you see a lot of individuals in the papyri who are called Persians. The Ptolemaic soldiers in papyri are always given an ethnic uh, identifier like Macedon to signify someone who, you know, at least theoretically was a Macedonian. And you have lots of Cyrenians and Athenians and people from other places. But we see a large number of people termed Persian. And it seems pretty clear from a number of different uh, papyrological sources that in the third century BC, these Persians are by and large Hellenized Egyptians or other North Africans. And they play a significant role in the Ptolemaic army. But those who serve in the cavalry are still listed as, as Persians throughout the third century. Those who serve in the infantry largely disappear in the 230s BC. And I suspect very strongly that that's because they're given Macedonian status. The Ptolemaic phalanx doesn't have an official Macedonian status until about 235 BC. And I think at that point, the, the Persians, who are really Hellenized Egyptians, are brought into the main body of the phalanx. And they're not the only large non-Macedonian group incorporated at that time. Uh, one of the largest ethnic groups serving in the Ptolemaic army are Thracians. At the Battle of Raphia, there are a body of Galatians and Thracians uh, who fight on the right wing of the Ptolemaic army in that battle. But in truth, uh, the Thracians are probably one of the largest ethnic bodies uh, across the Ptolemaic army. And so while there may have been perhaps newly recruited mercenary Thracians in that troop over on the, on the right wing, at the Battle of, of Raffia, of the you know, 40,000 Greco-Macedonian soldiers, probably a tenth of them uh, are actually Thracians. And then there's, there's a whole bunch of other, other people all scattered through, through Egypt who are incorporated into this Greco-Macedonian status. A lot of Cyrenians, as I've said, and sometimes we can even see by looking at the papyri, some of the ethnic distinctions within units. And so I have a chapter in the book that looks at some of these cases where we can make that sort of identification. And so for I'll just give a couple of examples with cavalry real quick, because they don't all get recategorized as Macedonian in this reform in the 230s BC, like the infantry do. So in one region of Egypt around Oxyrhynchus, their cavalry are heavily Cyrenian and Thracian. Just to the north is the region around Heraclea, uh, uh, Heracleopolis. And their cavalry are heavily Macedonian. And then just to the west in the Fayum region, the cavalry there include a lot of people from all around the Greek world. And so they make up a very large portion of the population there. And then you've got Galatians and South Anatolians and all sorts of other peoples, Judeans and others, who are incorporated in various ways into the Ptolemaic army. And if they're serving in the phalanx, they, that generally means that they're eventually going to get some sort of Macedonian status, which masks some of the diversity of Egypt over time. Now, I can't remember, and I know that Raffi is generally considered the uh, turning point of including the native Egyptians into the Macedonian phalanx. But if I remember correctly, wasn't there an instance during the reign of Ptolemy I? I think during the Third War of the Diadochoi, uh, it was Diodorus who said that when fighting against uh, Demetrius Polyarchides at the Battle of Gaza, Ptolemy had recruited Egyptian as Macedonian-styled phalangites. Is that something that actually happened, or am I conflating events in my head? Well, you're, you're maybe making a couple of leaps. What he says is that the bulk of Ptolemy's army, and he seems to be speaking about the infantry, uh, there's 20... 20 or 22,000 infantry at the Battle of Gaza in 312 BC. 
of those 20, 22,000, he says the bulk, so probably 11, 12,000 are Egyptians, many of whom he says are heavily armored for battle. And the Greek word that he uses for uh, heavily armored for battle, he only otherwise uses over his Hellenistic books for people who are armed in the Macedonian manner. And so I think that suggests that you're, prob- you're probably correct that some thousands of Egyptians were equipped to stand in the phalanx at the Battle of Gaza. And I think that there's, there's reason for connecting those troops to Alexander's practice of raising auxiliaries in the, the conquered regions, most famously, but not exclusively represented by the 30,000 Epigonoi who arrived near the end of his life, and to connect those to the troops at Gaza to the troops called Persians uh, at a later date, that this practice of creating a small, a fairly small body of uh, Hellenized troops fighting in Macedonian style, and we don't know which they emphasize more, or if sometimes you kind of let the Hellenization slip, and sometimes you let the military role slip, but uh, it seems that there was a, a practice being used by Ptolemy I and early in the reign of Ptolemy II as well to try to elevate some of the uh, Egyptians into Hellenizing project that had a military outcome. And so I, I, think, I think you're right about that. And I, I would tie that into this first stream of Hellenized Egyptians, Libyans, North Africans who serve in the Ptolemaic army and are largely invisible even in the documentary sources prior to the militarization of the Mahamoy in the Fourth Syrian War. And then after the, this is not in my book, but, but in the second century BC, the return of people who are clearly Egyptians and, and Libyans and Nubians classified as Persians serving in the Ptolemaic army, gaining uh, a Hellenizing status. Both those Persians and also much of the police force are also part of a Hellenizing project in the second century BC. And mostly, if you look at even in the papyri, you don't really see that Hellenizing project taking place. You just see Greek names. But certain types of names tend to become very popular among the Egyptian or you know, the North African Hellenizing class serving in the police or in these groups of, of Persians, troops serving for pay, uh, that tends to indicate that they're from this uh, Egyptian background. Despite the famous fecundity of its agriculture, once you left the fertility of the Nile, the Egyptian landscape quickly becomes harsh and unforgiving. How did the Ptolemaic army overcome the logistical challenges of protecting its own borders against the Seleucids while also expanding into places like Kyrene or, or Nubia? Well, that's, you know, they had to be ready to cover enormous distances through, as you pointed out, very difficult terrain. So one of the best examples for this is to think about Ptolemaic elephant hunting expeditions, which are really small military campaigns and traversed sometimes 2,500, even more than 3,000 miles round trip. Having the Nile River or the Red Sea or towards Kyrene, the Mediterranean was a big help because you can make use of, of ships. Operations into Kyrene or the upper Nile into modern day Sudan or down the Red Sea seldom required more than 10,000 men. If we look at all of the different operations where we can try to put a number on, on how many are involved, it's you know, the size of a Praetorian army in terms of the Roman Republic. And in many cases, the operations could have been even smaller than that, requiring a couple of thousand men or even a few hundred men, in which case naval transport and supply was pretty easily managed. Along those sort of, of, of routes and then uh, toward the border with the Seleucid state, whether we're talking Pelusium in Egypt or up into, into Syria, the Ptolemies position a lot of small garrison posts, towns, where a few hundred men could use terrain to their advantage and hold the line until larger forces were able to respond. The, the Ptolemies really developed their eastern, their position in the eastern delta, their position around Lebanon uh, over toward Damascus, in these, these ideas of creating lines of defense where the terrain could be used for their advantage as a force multiplier to allow larger forces to respond subsequently. But yeah, maintaining small uh, garrison posts, 
and keeping up a, a fairly high tempo of activity into some of these distant regions was an important activity of the Ptolemies. And so anytime that we think about them sitting around on their, sitting, you know, sitting on their hands and not doing anything in the time period before the Fourth Syrian War, as Polybius has us imagine, what we know in practice is that there, there's constant activity going on to try to maintain the, the garrisons at the frontiers of Egypt a thousand miles away nearly, or off on these elephant hunts even further away, where by the Fourth Syrian War, elephant hunters are beyond Deary, reaching well out uh, towards the Indian Ocean at that point on these, these elephant hunting expeditions. And so that is forcing them to, to move great distances. And, and the Ptolemies show some impressive ability to keep these troops supplied and moving, although there's a, a pretty famous papyrus where a, a barge went down that was supposed to take part of an ex- elephant hunting expedition back up uh, the Nile and they have to build a new boat and, and men are left there on shoestring rations until they can be relieved. And we, so we have a letter written to them saying, you know, help is on the way. But normally uh, the Ptolemies were pretty successful at doing this and the fact that they were able to resupply those troops and build new ships in order to recover them and bring them home is a testament to their logistical abilities. It wouldn't be a complete discussion of the Ptolemaic military unless we bring up its nautical adventures to some extent, which we did in the previous question, but let's go full throttle. How important of a role did the Navy play in Ptolemaic domestic and foreign policy? Okay, so the, the Navy is really important. Ptolemaic foreign policy, this is one thing Polybius you know, basically does get right, is built around protecting the riches of Egypt and maintaining these footholds for influence abroad that allow them to not only exert influence, but also to disrupt their adversaries at will. And the Navy is necessary to being able to do that. And so the the Ptolemies maintain these bases around the the edges of the Mediterranean, not only the permanent forces in Syria before Syria is lost in 200 BC, but the forces on Cyprus, forces in Lycia and Pamphylia, Calicia, Halicarnassus, Samos, Ephesus, others are these significant naval bases where the Ptolemies are basically rotating squadrons of ships around and maintaining this sort of presence. So that's that's core to Ptolemaic foreign policy. And then having those troops around or being able to move troops through naval power uh, is important for the Ptolemies when opportunistically big wars strike up and it allows the Ptolemies to land forces and try to make territorial gains. This happens in the Third Syrian War, where uh, naval forces are involved in the capture of a, a chunk of Thrace at the start of that conflict. As far as the Ptolemaic Navy, they're, they're particularly famous for their polyremes, for the, the super ships that they built, including 20 and 30 bank ships. I think even the larger polyremes that were more common, like the, the nines and tens, functioned importantly as show of force vessels. They, they don't have a stellar battle record. The Ptolemaic Navy does win some campaigns. It wins uh, a couple of battles, uh, but it actually... It, for being so impressive, it, it doesn't have a great battle record. Um, but having polyremes, having a big nine, a big 10, to go sail around anywhere in the Aegean, around Cyprus or Anatolia, is doing important messaging for the Ptolemies. And even if they don't win their big pitched battles very often, they lose, they lose several, they're still very effective for delivering troops, engaging in waterborne sieges, that help accomplish Ptolemaic strategic objectives. Uh, and so that's, that's fairly significant, even if uh, it's, it's, to me, the, their land army tends to have more successes than their, than their uh, operations at sea. Aside from those super ships, there's also the, the Nile Navy, the riverine fleet. There are ships in the Red Sea that are tremendously important for long range campaigning, as we've mentioned. As far as the, the success record of those ships, most of the biggest successes came uh, under Ptolemy I and Ptolemy II, bringing relief to, to Rhodes during Demetrius's siege, in which Ptolemaic soldiers are actually landed in the city and play a very important role in defeating Antigonid troops. Uh, most of the key fighting done in the defense of Rhodes is actually done by Ptolemaic forces. One of these, I argue in my book, uh, is a a man named Ananias who's identified as a general 
among the defenders. I, I argue that he's probably, he's not mentioned in Diodorus as a Ptolemaic commander, but given his name, he's almost certainly Jewish, and I suggest that he probably is a, a Ptolemaic commander who dies in some of the most crucial fighting uh, during that siege. They also break up Demetrius's hold in Anatolia. They break up the fleet of Demetrius in that pivotal moment where he's planning to reinvade Asia uh, with a massive fleet and 100,000 troops being concentrated in multiple different areas. Uh, one of the key things that happens, you know, when we, when we think about that moment that sends Demetrius from the peak of his power scuttling off through Asia Minor, we think about the invasions of Macedonia by Lysimachus and by Pyrrhus. And what, what happens in that period that's actually really, really important is that the whole Ptolemaic fleet sails into the Aegean and its arrival there is, is, a, is a really important component. And then you have under Philadelphus, this Ptolemaic sea in the Aegean. It lasts for a, a couple of decades of, of important Ptolemaic influence in the Aegean world. It's not used as effectively as you'd like to see it used but it does help establish uh, Ptolemaic influence and may have helped Ptolemy II recruit a lot of new soldiers to Egypt. I was recently asked this question by a listener in my own Q&A episode, but I was curious to hear your thoughts. In the Battle of Raphia in 217, Ptolemy IV managed to defeat the army of Antiochus III of the Seleucid Empire and end the Fourth Syrian War. In your opinion, why did Ptolemy not take the advantage and pressure Antiochus to cede more territory in the subsequent negotiations? I, I, I'm curious to know what your answer was, but uh, uh, you know, my first thought is sometimes hindsight is 2020. Ptolemy has just survived a series of devastating defections uh, from his officer corps. And without those defections, Antiochus doesn't make it as far as Raphia. If you're looking at the war on the whole, you, you might be inclined to see the defections as an unlikely contingency, a bad break, apart from which the defensive system in Syria has actually worked very well. In that sense, maintaining the pre-war borders could be viewed as a way to stabilize the conflict between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids and try to return to peace. So I think that's one possibility. I at least think that it's possible to understand why the decision was made in strategic terms without resorting to Ptolemy just wanted to go back home and start drinking again, which is uh, Polybius's answer. And there may be a little bit of that. Uh, he's won a great victory, and so it's possible that that is part of, of what happens here. But I, I think there are a couple of other lessons. And then in terms of the, the real failure of the Fourth Syrian War, I, I have a a different thing to suggest is the thing that we should be talking about. But first, uh, in terms of why you stop the war where Ptolemy does, which is at the northern end of the Beka Valley, uh, right at the old border with the Seleucid Empire, the, the Eleutherus River. One lesson from the Third Syrian War was that the departure of the whole army from Egypt for a long time was an invitation to revolt back at home. And so you, you want to avoid doing that. One of the other things to think about is that the next step that he could have made beyond restoring the old border and what he also did at the same time, which was punish the rebellious tribes from the Haran, south and southeast of Damascus. Aside from doing those two things he did do, the next thing that he could have done would have been an attack on Apamea itself, one of the cities of the Seleucid Tetrapolis. Would that have been the right move? On the one hand, Ptolemaic armies had raided Apamea multiple times in previous wars, potentially in all three previous Syrian wars, it is possible that Ptolemaic armies raided Apamea. So in that sense, it's a little difficult not to justify attempting an attack on that city or on some of the other Seleucid cities of southern Syria nearby. Taking and holding that city is a much more difficult prospect. In geographic terms, it would have been fairly difficult, but it might have countered the loss of Seleucia, which took place at the start of the war. But Apamea, even more than Seleucia, would have been very difficult to hold. So what are you trying to accomplish in this campaign against Apamea? The conquest of the whole Seleucus, you take Apamea and then keep going and try to reunite Alexander's empire. I don't think there's a whole lot of that as a real strategic objective that people have in mind very often in the Hellenistic period. And so if it's not that, I'm not sure it ends up being that big of a deal whether you attempt a raid on Apamea 
or focus instead on stabilizing the border and harrying uh, the peoples of the Haran who had fought against you at Rafia and helped turn the tide against you in the conquest of Syria by Antiochus III. Now, the other thing is, is what I think is the real strategic failure of the Fourth Syrian War. And there are plenty of things we could talk about, but, but my chief complaint is with the Ptolemaic misuse of Cyprus. Cyprus was used effectively as a staging point for operations in previous wars. The garrisons and fleets at Cyprus were an effective counterweight against the Seleucid army whenever it attempted to deploy its main forces into this uh, Ptolemaic province of Syria and Phoenicia. And so it should have been this threat against the flank and rear of Antiochus while he's trying to push the lines into Syria. It plays no role. After using Cyprus well in previous generations, the misuse of Cyprus as a position to threaten and assault your chief enemies, flank and rear, maybe even retake Seleucia, is my biggest problem with Ptolemaic military action in the whole war. I suspect the reason that they failed to use Cyprus effectively was that they had shipped much of the island's garrison to Egypt to join the field army uh, and retained the navy at Cyprus for security because they were denuded of most of their garrison because they'd shipped them off to Egypt. And I think that was a terrible use of their forces. Usually the concentration of your, of your forces for military action tends to be good. This is a case where the Ptolemies really needed to use those troops on Cyprus effectively as a counter to make up for the defections they suffered in Syria, and they failed to do this. To kind of tie this all together, your book concludes following the death of Ptolemy IV in the year 204 BC. Is there any particular reason as to why you chose that date, at least in terms of the structure of the military or the nature of the Ptolemaic government itself? Yeah, so the, the death of Ptolemy IV and is, is part of a large and complex crisis that affects Ptolemaic Egypt for several years, either side of 200 BC. The crisis of this period includes dynastic infighting, the struggle by Agathocles and Sosibius uh, for control of the young Ptolemy V, the invasion of Antiochus in the Fifth Syrian War, and uh, Tarake, the, the great revolt of the Egyptians. Uh, that, that lasted from just before Ptolemy IV's death uh, down to 186 BC, which is a, a robust and dangerous insurgency. And all three of those crises, which take place basically overlapping one another, uh, have dramatic impacts on the direction of Ptolemaic Egypt. The question I was trying to pursue, which is whether I could really try to flip that narrative a little bit about early glory and then later decline and instead show a, a more of a uh, story of continuity from Ptolemy I to Ptolemy IV, a growth trajectory, and follow some of those lines, uh, those trajectories and continuities from Ptolemy IV, or uh, from Ptolemy I to Ptolemy IV. In trying to do that, it didn't make sense to then try to wrangle with all of the struggles that followed that first long century of Ptolemaic rule. And so I, I left those out. I have written uh, several pieces on both Panium uh, and on the Great Revolt uh, that we can, uh, uh, they're in my academia page, and so we can link those uh, today maybe. Um, and uh, I have written about those things, but they, they don't really fit into the story I'm trying to tell in this book. And so we, I, the book actually starts and ends with Raffia. Rafi is one of the largest pitched battles of antiquity, at least where we can be fairly confident about the numbers on the field. We have plenty of battles where the claimed numbers are, are far larger, but Rafia may be the largest battle where we're actually fairly confident about the numbers of troops on the field, or one of the largest. And so I started, I started there, you know, what do we know about the Ptolemaic army? And I finish with Rafia and its aftermath. And to me, that makes that that works for trying to establish what I'm trying to tell in the book. To me, the, those changes in the crisis that happen are part of how Polybius tends to read second century Ptolemaic Egypt back into his narrative of the the latter third century Ptolemaic Egypt. And so I say, you know, if if we leave that part of the story out and just look at the sources for this earlier period, does the narrative end up looking different? Now, Ptolemy IV is not a strong king. He's not a particularly warlike king. 
But in, in the book, I, I try to make an argument, and I think I do it fairly effectively, that there's a lot of that continuity and a story of growth where the Ptolemaic army begins with a bunch of efforts. You know, we can, we can look at a number of important efforts back in the 260s BC, significant efforts under Ptolemy III in the 230s and 220s BC, leading into the Battle of Raphia, rather than in the Polybian narrative, the battle, the, the army that fights at Raphia has been cobbled together through a hasty reform in 219 to 217 BC. And that's just not true. And so being able to tell that story is part of what I try to do. And with that, I believe this is a good place to end our discussion. And once again, I'd like to say thank you so much for coming onto the show and sharing your work. If listeners would like to know more about your book and how to get it, uh, where should they go in to find it? And are there any future projects or social media accounts you'd like to share for listeners? So they can find it in the online store for pen and sword books or through most online retailers like Amazon. You can follow me on Twitter, Professor Paul J. My next projects I'm, I'm working on considering a, a follow on to this book on the later Ptolemaic army. Uh, I'm also working on a book on great power competition in the ancient world, looking at the uh, systems of different paired powers and where the contingencies were located inside of their internal power structures. So rather than focusing an analysis of conflict on international relations, focusing instead on internal composition and contingency and what sort of lessons learned we can take from the willingness or unwillingness or assessment or failed assessment to target some of those contingencies and conflict between these ancient powers. Uh, so that's the that's the big book project I'm working on right now and, and a few things on ancient leadership as well. I'll make sure to include Dr. Jostino's links in the podcast description and in the episode notes, which can be found on my website at hellenisticagepodcast.wordpress.com. So until next time, you've been listening to the Hellenistic Age Podcast. <laughs>